and welcome back to the 1970s Stereo Sound Stereogram Restoration. This is part four. If you've not been watching the first three parts, it's pretty good, <laughs> if I say so myself. So we restore the case, we restore the record player, and we restore the actual chassis. This is the final part where we do the modifications, We're going to do some exciting Bluetooth in there, and put it all together. Do you reckon it's going to look great? Let's hope so. That chassis is looking loads better now. Looks really clean and nice. So one of the things that the, the owner wants, just to recap, uh, they want to have lots of connections. They want to be able to connect a CD player or, or anything else they want to connect to the back of this. So I'm going to put some RCA sockets on the back. So that's quite straightforward, easy to do. The other thing was to put add uh, Bluetooth. Now I use these Bluetooth modules. They're really small and inexpensive <laughs> uh, they're, they're great little things and they sound brilliant some of the irritations of these little modules as good as they are is on the back it tells you there exactly what connections to make on there but some of it's not so straightforward and they've got a few little quirks that I don't like yeah when these power up they make a stupid noise a stupid little tune it plays really annoying so I like to have a muting circuit which mutes the output of these when it powers on to hide that junk. This actually has a mute output which is great so it actually tells you when it's going to play some music or not uh, which is brilliant because that enables me to do some sort of like invisible switching between a device's sort of native audio like record player or tape deck or whatever and playing the Bluetooth does it automatically but something you have to watch I've noticed when streaming music through like Spotify in between tracks you'll get a short pause and the mute signal will drop out so you need a circuit which sort of suspends that a little bit so it doesn't keep dropping in and out because when it does drop in and out you might find you get some sort of amplifier misbehaving little little pops or little thumps when it does it so you don't want to do that you know too often a while ago I came up with a circuit that handled all of that um, which I've sort of put out on this schematic and I had the foresight to actually make a circuit board design and had several made the you know this saves a lot of time however the downside is there's no components on it yet so I've got to actually put some surface mount components on this to get it ready to take the module so I'm going to get on with that now so this is the blank board, it needs a bit of preparation first, um, let's get that out of the way. Um, first thing I need to do is apply a solder flux to all these little pads so it will take the solder more readily. So I'm going to just trowel some on, it's got this tub of this sort of greasy uh, flux material, it's very sticky and mucky stuff. I'm just going to just get a bit on this little knife thing and it looks like <laughs> it looks like rancid butter, doesn't it? I'm just going to sort of smear it on, only where the surface mount pads are. Oh. And this will just disappear up in a plume of smoke, to be honest, but it makes a lot of difference for the how the solder flows on here. Um, I'm not using any solder paste on this job, it's too small. Uh, I'm just going to solder it in the good old fashioned way. That'll do. Put a bit of solder on the iron and just run the tip over the solder pads there. That will put a tiny amount of solder on each pad. We likely do these pads for the Bluetooth module as well. So that's the process done <laughs> of tinning doesn't look a lot different yet. Uh, now we start putting the components on. Annoyingly these components tend to come in tapes, this will be a little bridge rectifier on here, little four pin device. Oh, that has to land in the stuff doesn't it? So, I'll try not to get my hands all over this. Not that it's sensitive to it, it's just messy. So have I got this the right way around? The surface mount components, um, <laughs> they look quite easy to fit there's no holes to mess with but part of the trouble you get is getting the heat into the copper board below <laughs> oh fucking hell sometimes it can be quite a challenge because the surface area of the pads is tiny and it takes a lot of time to get that heat in it doesn't always go right 
when the components are added to the boards in a factory they actually lay them all on um, with a little robot and then they go through an oven typically just to solder the whole thing in one go it's a lot quicker than what I'm doing this is a voltage regulator gives me 5 volts to power the Bluetooth with this is a dual operational amplifier or, or op amp as they're known this actually amplifies the signals from the Bluetooth module and boosts it up to the levels that I need or not need depending on the application but it's there anyway just slightly tack on these little components just to stop them blowing away when I put the hot air gun on it <laughs> it's a normal trick these fiddly things are these tiny resistors they really are a pain <laughs> these aren't the smallest components either for surface mount they do much smaller these are an 0805 size and they come much smaller than that as well I wouldn't design anything with smaller resistors though. Not for me to solder it. It's a bit of a puzzle putting these together. <laughs> Even though I designed it, I don't remember where all the parts go. Um, so you tend to be looking um, in the schematic drawing to find out you know, which component you need. And then the next part you have to find out typically in these sort of selection boxes of which resistor it is or what, what value. And then you're scouring through the circuit board trying to find out where they go and then putting them on your tweezers. It's a bit of fun. What have we got next? 10k number 9. Resistor 9. Number 9. Number 9. Is that a Beatles song? Where are you? There you go there. The trick with getting resistors on neatly is if you can heat both ends up at the same time then they sit down nice and neatly. I don't know what that one is. What are you doing there? You shouldn't be there. You're a little rogue. Pretty transistors, I won't go the right way up. Ah. I'll stick them in all of the vacant transistor locations. Just Tack one pin on, it'll do good progress so far. Not making a complete disaster of it. Let's just tack these legs down here. And number two. Number five. There we go. Got to fit these diodes on now. Looks like there's not many, but these things are horrible little cylinders, little glass tubes, they are a pain. They just want to fly off everywhere. Don't know why I designed them in to be honest. Has that got it? Has it? It appears it has. We'll hold it still because I've almost got the pad spacing a bit wrong on this. That one's gone okay. Come back. Diode number three. Same story. I've put some little Zener diodes. These will be the ones that give an 8 volt drop. So notice they look exactly the same as the last ones I just put on so it's not good news if you get them mixed up Now that's tacked on all the tiny surface mount parts on here. I'm just going to neaten it all up a little bit before I put the big parts on. This process now is called reflowing. It's nice to get the hot air on there, heat all of the connections up and the solder pads all at once 
and then the surface tension of the solder will actually centralise it nice and neatly. Well, usually. Now time to solder on the Bluetooth module itself. We just plop that on there. Make sure that the uh, the aerial part lines up there because there's no um, ground plane, which is like the copper pad on the back, the big copper area that blocked the signal. So I try not to block the signal. I'm gonna hold that as straight as I can. That's about it. Let's see if I can encourage this solder that we put on. There's only a little bit to wick up into there, there we go, there's one there's two might add a little bit extra in but that's basically on now, that's pretty good that's all these surface mount parts fitted um, it's left this sort of sticky gunky residue off and what I do now, now is the time to get rid of that because when you put the larger components on <laughs> you won't be able to clean it off so it's easily done, put it in a little bowl and pour on some sort of manky old isopropyl alcohol. This is stuff I've used before so it's not completely pure but it's great for this sort of job. So I'm just going to pour a bit on and just let that sit for a while. So a little bit of a agitation there. Let's get the get busy with the brush shall we. Give it a bit of a help. See if there's any leak through onto the back of the board. Doesn't look too bad. Just let that drip a bit. And then stick it on a paper towel. Just give it a bit of a wipe and a pad. There we go. Now it's ready for part two of the soldering, the big parts. And here we've got all the large components that need to go on the through hole ones. Many capacitors and a couple of reed relays really. Um, we'll start to put them in. So just to make sure the holes line up and just bend the legs slightly, get them in. With those in place, just flip the board over, grab the iron, a bit of solder, and just solder each little pad. Right, we can put these little film capacitors in. These are the ones that the sound travels through these. Which is why they're these film types, so they don't sort of cause any sort of weirdness to the signal. Just bend the legs to uh, stop them falling out. You notice here the solder films always come straight at your face every time. There's actually a YouTube video by someone who's actually analysed this, and it's all down to the sort of the aerodynamics from having your your body hunched over with your arms either side. Of course, it's like updraft and it comes right at you. Luckily I like it. You put these large caps in, these filter the um, power supply, make it nice and smooth. I'm trying to <laughs> get these to sit straight as well. Then I think, oh, should have done these first. <laughs> the little gain potentiometers, these are important. Ah, see, now I put components in the way of it. It's difficult to line the holes up. There's that one. That one's in a bit of open ground here. That should be okay. 
yet. Might clear a bit of space to just snip these long leads off. These capacitors are there to sort out the timing in the circuit. Um, or the delays that I that I want. That's completed the assembly of the Bluetooth module, so this is ready to power some stereograms. Nice! Well I've started with a rough sketch of how I'm going to make the mixing circuit, the part of the mod that will mix the four different inputs together. I sort of sketched it out first of all, a little simple sketch, which I then sort of turned into a proper schematic, so it's a lot easier to work from with that sort of thing. And I've now created a circuit board layout from that which I've printed onto this acetate sheet which is stuck in the book <laughs> so, come out oh that's the power of static that is it doesn't want to let go so what we have here is um, I've actually printed it out twice on the same acetate sheet and what that will do that allows me to put them one on top of the other to double them up so I've got a uh, twice the sort of contrast and it'll give me a much better quality etch because it's going to be using uh, ultraviolet light to expose to a pre-sensitised board. I'm going to cut these. I need one side to be slightly bigger than the other so I'm going to go with the scissors just straight across like that and then just trim them. If we say that's the bottom one so the top one will sit right on top like that. So I'm going to trim that a bit And trim there. Okay, now they should sort of sit down nicely on top of each other. Just align the traces on top. Just get some tape and just hold that down. Let's tape it from all four sides. Make sure it's flat. I'm going to be using a homemade sort of <laughs> ultraviolet light box. It's, it was cheap to make and <laughs> quicker than waiting for the post. So this is quite a straightforward thing. Just some, it's using some um, counterfeit money detectors. These lamps out of there, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> so what I need to do, this is single sided copper board that's got a coating on that's um, resistive to the chemicals that etch the uh, copper away, but they're also uh, sensitive to ultraviolet light so we'll just expose these so you have to first of all peel this lay this layer off this protective sticker a bit fiddly oh ah, there we go so that's stuck on there so that's the sensitive side let's not leave that in the light too long make sure that's nice and cleared just place our um, artwork on the top of it, put the lid down and we're good to go. So turn that on, ultraviolet light coming out of there and just sit it on. We'll start the timer, about four minutes or so.
Whilst that's counting down, I'm just going to get the developing solution ready. I don't know what's in it. <laughs> it's, it's crusty and it's been used quite a lot. We just pour that in. Try not to pour any sludge in it on the bottom of the bottle. That'll do. Right, we're now ready to develop this. Let's get that out of the way. See if it's worked. <laughs> this board only just fits in the bowl. <laughs> I never checked. <laughs> Whoops. The chemicals turn the um, exposed um, coating black. You see it just comes off quite easily in the solution. The developing time is a bit hit and miss, it's dependent on temperature. It's generally about 20 degrees in here or so, but it's winter at the moment, so it might be down to about 15, but I tend to go by eye how it looks. If you leave it in too long though, it'll actually take off all of the uh, coating and then you'll have to start all over again. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Let's pull that out. And rinse. What I'm going to do with this is actually going to float this in a little uh, bowl of ferric chloride which is um, not the most pleasant of stuff because it just eats to the copper. So I'm just going to put a little handle on it so I can pick it up. So I'm just going to take a bit of tape and just uh, stick it on the back of the board like this. And then you'll see how beautifully it sticks the gloves on there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll try that again. <laughs> This is good tape, it sticks well. There we are. So I can just hold it like this, that's a lot better. Let's see if I can get these gloves back on. Ah, I think I salvaged that one alright. So, now this is a bit nasty stuff and I did once get this splash in my eye so I'm going to put some safety glasses on because it was really unpleasant. I can tell you it was worse than catching Covid. So this stuff not been used for a while. All the sediments will be on the bottom but we should get a bit of a... We should be a brown colour but the more it's used the more green it becomes because it's got more copper in it. But I'm just going to pour in about three quarters of this. It looks like it needs filtering. Yeah this is pretty nasty. Yeah you can see all this actual bits of copper floating in the top that's not going to be very good for me so I need to filter this stuff uh, more delays so get this beaker funnel put some filter paper in oh, I think this is going to take a while try not to pour it everywhere Mark It's a bit like watching paint dry, but this is watching ferric chloride filter through a coffee filter. Hopefully it gets rid of all the little floaters in there anyway. That looks like it's finished. It's got all that sludge out at least. Right, we'll go with this again. Back in the bowl without the floating bits of copper. much better. So the plan was get rid of these bubbles ah, nice and still like a mill pond. And you just float the board on the top of it and back to the etching. 
I can see through it that's a good sign this is looking pretty good to me I think let's get a few drips off and yes nice clean etch let's give that a wash off I've come up with a design for adding the extra sockets on the back. I'm going to create this extra panel with six RCA sockets and some switches for the muting on there. So that's my sort of plan. I've got this sheet of aluminium. Let's just knock that up. Trying to do this very neatly and accurately. <laughs> if I was a bit smarter, I'd have just glued the paper printout onto the metal. Why didn't I do that? Oh well. Six point five mil. These are ten, and down the bottom. Oh, they're all ten. <laughs> ten mil. And this one here is five mil. Okay. I love a bit of sheet metal work occasionally in the morning. This little metal sheet is a brilliant tool. Very clean results. Always centre pop the holes before drilling. Although if you get this bit wrong, your holes are out of centre and there's no way to rescue it. Put little pilot holes in first. Um, I favour a 2.5mm drill for the pilot holes. Don't ask me why. I'm a big fan of these step drills. These are great for working on sort of sheet metal. Give a really nice finish and you don't get any sort of problems with the sheet of metal trying to fly around the drill. Brilliant things. Just to deburr these holes, just get the plate over. See how we compared. Can peel this plastic cover off now, reveal the nice shiny surface. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a plan anyway. It's probably where the swarf is uh, torn through it. There we go. So that should sit on there, just like that. Pretty close. Cutting a hole in the thing you restored seems a bit weird, uh, but we're going to do a nice neat job. I've got this jigsaw set to a very slow cut, there's no sort of oscillation in backwards and forwards. Try and do it nice and smooth and neatly. Just putting some wood stain on here just to sort of <laughs> make it blend in a bit. No one's going to see it, but it makes me feel better. To make this new rear plate more um, <laughs> professional looking, I'm going to put a label over it that gives all the sort of markings and makes it look like the original thing. So I've laid it out on the computer, pretty much to the design that I came up with before, and it's going to print it. Well, this little thing will do the printing and it will cut all the holes out, which uh, saves a lot of time, makes a very nice, and neat job. Funny noises come out of these. Well, that's what we get. Looks good to me. What I'm going to do now is just peel all these little dead bits out. 
this is where it could all go horribly horribly wrong these things always start up really good when you put all the sockets and the switches in So that's the original plate and this is the new one that's going to go right next to it. I think it looks pretty good. Now we've got the very satisfying part of soldering the components onto this brand new piece of circuit board. Let's get on with it. Although this looks like bare copper, it's not. This has still got the sort of etch resist all over it. So it needs to be taken off. Which you can quickly do with either isopropyl alcohol if you've got a bit of time on your hands or quicker still is acetone. Pour a little bit on there. This stuff evaporates very quickly, so <laughs> we need to move fairly quickly. Yeah. That should be good. There's not actually that many components that need to be soldered to this board, which is good news. I'm also using big chunky through hole components. This is because they're going to be easy to you know easier to handle and see in the lab so the surface mount stuff as you saw earlier is a bit of a faff now this is a bit of a style that i've sort of developed which we sort of call it dead bug mounting so instead of having to drill the holes in the board which is very time consuming i basically come up with a scheme where we take the chips and we basically <laughs> flatten them now chip flattening is <laughs> it's a multi-stage process so what we'll do we first get the get a bar and just basically just push it on just to spread the legs a little bit so we form them like that so far they still need to go a bit more so we take a larger diameter thing a bit of aluminium here and just squash it carefully again there we are that's about the form we want so now we can actually just put this on the board and you'll find it just sits there just nicely like that I'm going to just put a bit of flux on the pads. I've just got this old flux pen. I don't know if it still works. Yeah, it does. And just wipe that on these pads. It just helps clean up the copper and makes the solder flow better. Each of these little dots is also where components are going to go or solder connections. If I can see any more little ones, there's a little one. Now we get to the stage where I'm just going to put some solder on each of the pads. Just tin them, little blobs on there. And I think that's all of them. Right, we're going to take our first chip. This we're going to put this one on here, and we'll just offer it up onto the pads. Right, with that one on there, we can just strain it up. There we are. Right, the resistors <laughs> will need bending to the right sort of shape to bridge the gap. However, this piece of wood happens to be just about the right sort of thickness for it. Just bend the legs like that. Then once you've bent them like that, just get some little pliers and we'll just bend the legs like that the other way. And once they're bent in that fashion, just snip the one end, just have a little foot like that. 
then you've got a handle to hold it by and you can solder it on. Just solder that on. Then once that's on in that way, just a little snip at the other end. Press it down. Oop. <laughs> oh, there it is. Is that shiny? I couldn't see where it was. There we are. <laughs> I wish I really could solder them all together this fast. <laughs> hey, look at me go! There you are, the fastest soldier in the West Midlands. <laughs> I don't know, one of the last parts putting is just a wire link. So, same again, just get a piece of wire, bend it over this wood. Have a bit of luck, I don't burn my finger holding this. Actually, if we're quick, it'll be fine. Yes. I forgot to tin the pads <laughs> for connecting our wires on. Oh, not too late anyway. That's looking pretty blingy now, isn't it? Very smart. We're at that stage now where I guess I need to actually <laughs> test it. I'll right, just connect some power leads onto here. Plus and minus 15 volts. And we'll see if it blows up. Nah, not bad at all. 16 milliamps each side. That's pretty promising. I don't think we've got much trouble. For wiring the test sockets into this board, it's probably <laughs> it's easier to actually just wire this into it. They're only going to be about six inches apart, so I'm just going to do all the wiring on the back of that right now. Now I've made all the connections to the board and the back panel on the bench, I can actually wire this up to the test equipment and see how well it works. So I'm just going to plug in some signals here. So this one will be sort of emulate CD and we'll have over here. Or something on the line input. So I've got some signals going in. Just got to turn it on. And we got something. <laughs> I think looking at this, I've got them inputs mixed up. That's actually rather promising. But yeah, the CD input on this one is, let me see, it's about 2 kilohertz. This one is 1 kilohertz off another signal generator. This is absolutely fine. You add the two together and you get this. So I've got the whole system wired in together now. I've got the Bluetooth integrated with the mixing board I've just made. Looks like it's working great. I've got the mixed inputs over there. If I mute one channel, we just get the one. I can switch to the other. Excellent. Run both on. Oh no, it's both off. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> both on. There we go. And it's party piece is the Bluetooth. So if we get the phone on there, just Spotify. And that should switch over. And it has. That's now playing <laughs> Abbey Road by the Beatles. It's only on the oscilloscope though, YouTube. Bad luck, can't copyright that. <laughs> so, there's really nothing left to do with this apart from <laughs> shove it in the stereogram. This job is getting perilously close to being finished. <laughs> Thank God. Let's put this big, beautiful, snake-like collection of electronics in. Hidden away. Right, so the output panel, that has to be fed through there. Ah, nice snug fit and nicely done. Start with this one as it's nearest <laughs> to its position. Find the hole. Come on. And the original panel. Now 
Now I'm trying to sort this <laughs> rat's nest out. Right, I think. Right, these go to the record deck. So they can just go over the back. And then what have I got? So that sort of sits there. and go next to it. These are the import cables. So this is what goes into the what was the record? This would have plugged into the record deck, but now it's going to go into the Bluetooth module. So, let's connect the ground and the output wire. Stick another screw in this corner. Oh, bloody hell. God, this is like watching your dad do something. Not too deep, mind you. God, that was easy when you do it right, isn't it? <laughs> so, the next one, the Bluetooth module. Pilot hole there. And a pilot hole here. Right, the transformer's next, but the trouble is I can't really reach it. <laughs> oh, blimey. If I just reach over, I'll try and pop a hole in anywhere. We get one in. So, what can I tidy up? All these messy cables like here. Let's see if that'll just slide in there without falling over. Let's prop that up a bit. Gonna stay there. And does that reach in there? Yes, just long enough. Stay. Kind of give this record deck a little test. Let's put an old LP on. Will it go? Of course it'll go, we've already tested it really. Well I'm really happy how this has turned out. Brilliant, it's working and this trick never gets boring. Pause it, back to the record. After four seconds. Oh, I love this engineering. <laughs> and the radio. Ooh. Help if I tuned it in, wouldn't it? Swedish prospect. Oh. <laughs> Such fun. Catch you next time.